Well, welcome back, everybody. We're about to learn about momentum and starting our next unit, so get ready. Our first thing we need to define is momentum, which strangely enough is designated by the letter P. But it's something that you're already familiar with. It's actually just inertia in motion. So the idea that an object in motion wants to stay in motion, we used to call that just inertia, but more specifically, that's called momentum. And if we look at the formula for momentum, and notice that momentum has the arrow above it, just like velocity, and that's because momentum definitely is a vector quantity. But momentum itself is going to be equal to mass times velocity. And that makes total sense because inertia is directly related to mass, and velocity is de definitely related to motion. So it's not that confusing of an equation. Also, the units for momentum, since it's mass, will be kilograms, and velocity will be meters per second. Now, momentum by itself is just kind of a number. We'll get through it, but the change in momentum eventually is what's going to be really important and how it relates to something we'll learn about soon called impulse. A couple examples. First of all, objects that are slow moving can still have a great amount of momentum. For example, a large bus. It has a huge mass, and even if it's moving slowly, it'll still give you a big number for momentum. Vice versa, you could have a tinier object with low mass like a bullet, but since it moves so fast, it has a great amount of momentum. Remember, momentum is how hard it would be to slow down once it's moving, and a bullet would definitely be hard to slow down. Or, if you got your hand in the way, it would be a, certainly a bad day. Now, even though something may be huge and massive, it may have no momentum. For example, like this elephant that is at rest. Since it's not moving, velocity is zero, so therefore mass times velocity would be zero. There'd be no momentum whatsoever. So don't forget that. Big mass or big velocity, we can have big momentum, but only if the objects are moving. Now, an important side idea is impulse, which is going to relate directly to momentum. Impulse is designated by the letter J. An impulse is actually measured by the equation force times time. This relationship between force and time is going to be incredibly important to us during collisions because it could be life or death. In fact, as force increases in a collision, that means that the time during the collision decreased. They're inversely related. And vice versa, if the time of the collision increases, that means that the force decreased, which is what we like during a collision so that we're safer. But either way, impulse is directly related to the change in momentum. So that's why when we really look at it, this equation of force times time and the change in moment momentum really come to this finalized equation that is important to us, which is force times time is equal to the change in momentum. Now, a side note, usually mass isn't going to change in our problems. We're not dealing with nuclear decay or anything like that. And remember that velocity change is really velocity final minus velocity initial. That means we can really write our equation as impulse, which is force times time, is equal to the mass, which really won't change for us in our calculations, times the change in velocity, which is really just velocity final minus velocity initial. All right, so that's really the equation you want to know. That's how impulse and change and momentum are related. If we look at this example, the football player is hitting the other player, basically exerting an amount of force over a given amount of time to stop the momentum of the ball carrier. That relationship would be directly related to this equation that we just talked about. Let's look into that further. As we talked about, as one goes up, the other one goes down in the impulse equation. So the change in momentum is going to be the same no matter what. Two football players collide, you're going to eventually want to bring them to a stop with a tackle. You get in a car crash, eventually you're coming to a stop. So the change in momentum is kind of set. The thing that can be different is force in time. It's all about the time of the collision and then therefore the amount of force that's going to be impacted on you or any other object. So let's think about boxing. If you have a punch and it's extended a period of time, so you punch and the boxer kind of moves back with the punch and increases the time of the punch, then the force decreases because the amount of time increased. So that's better for the guy that's getting hit. Now, if you get popped really quick with all that guy's force and the time was low, 
that increases the force. So you, as the person getting the hit, is affected even more so by that. That's the power of impulse. If you watch this through Canvas or our online link here, you can see this YouTube video where the man drops a melon by itself, and the melon cracks in half. But when he drops the melon inside of a helmet, and I'll make this look like the helmet, the cantaloupe doesn't crack. Why? Because in this case, the time was very little when it dropped and hit the ground, so the force was huge. In this case, the time was longer, so the force on the cantaloupe was less. That's the whole idea behind helmets. When your head hits something or hits the ground, you increase the time of the collision, therefore lowering the force and potentially saving your life. We know airbags save our lives, but how? When you get in a car crash, a sensor detects that there's a huge deceleration and sends a, a message to an electrical circuit which ignites something called sodium azide. Basically, through a mixture of a couple different chemicals, sodium azide basically breaks down and decomposes into nitrogen gas. Now, this does it so hot and so fast that the gas expands and inflates the airbag. In fact, it happens in about 50 milliseconds, okay? In this example, it says about 40 milliseconds. I've heard both. But your eyes blink in 20 milliseconds. So one quarter of the time it takes to blink your eye is how fast an airbag fills up. Why do we even want airbags, though? The idea is for the airbag is going to increase your time of the collision. Therefore, the force your head or body feels is less. By elongating the duration of the collision, you're safer because there's less force on your body. Now, airbags just aren't at the steering wheel, right? They're on the sides of the vehicles now for side impact. Passengers have it as well. So they're really getting sophisticated in figuring out how much should they fill up with air, when should they fill up with air, and what parts of the car. It's really amazing. Now, if we have two examples, this car goes and bounces off the brick wall, and this car goes and crumples and smashes into the brick wall. At first, you may think you'd rather bounce instead of smash, but when you really look at it, the change in velocity here is about nine meters per second, and this change in velocity on this one is about five meters per second. So your change in momentum is actually less for the car that smashes. Why is that? It's because when you smash into a brick wall, once again, you're increasing the time of the collision, so you decrease the force. By doing that, you have a lower force on your body. It's safer. And because those numbers are lower altogether, you have a less or smaller change in momentum, which is better for your body. The less change in momentum, the safer you are. Many people are surprised by that. So when you get in an accident, you do not want to bounce. Rebounding is bad because there's a shorter amount of time, which means a greater amount of force. So the idea is we want our cars to crumple. We want them to smash because they increase the time of the collision and make the force on our body, bodies even less. Take a look at these last examples before we end our lecture here. Crumple zones in the cars are obviously in the front and back, but now they're in the sides as well of the car. Even those milliseconds, those extra slight time that is increased for the collision may be enough to decrease the force so that we don't die or we don't have to go to the hospital. It is incredible how safe cars are now and how fast we're going and getting an accident and we can still survive. Of course, it's not perfect or foolproof, but it is a lot safer than it used to be. I challenge you to look on YouTube at some of the crash test dummy cars from old cars versus new cars with and without airbags, etc. and see just how much safer cars are nowadays. It is amazing. By leaps and bounds have we improved. All right, but this is a lecture on momentum and impulse. Hopefully you see the relationship between us and safety and impulse and of course how impulse and change in momentum are directly related.